tonight on the Phenomenon Radio Show, radio broadcast veteran Ray Hobbs, one of the world's most high-profile military experiencers, John Burroughs, researcher and author James Warrow, and filmmaker, YouTuber, and truth stalker Professor Simon. We begin in the Pacific. Carrier groups encountering strange objects, engaging FA-18 aircraft, and later in the show, key players in the weaponization of UAP, and those with serious interests in the effects from close encounters with real UAPs. All of this tonight on Phenomenon Radio. Pacific Ocean. On November 14, 2004, about 100 miles southwest of San Diego, California, the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group, which included a nuclear-powered carrier and the missile cruiser USS Princeton, were conducting a series of drills prior to deployment to the Persian Gulf. Pilots flying the latest F-A-18 Hornet fighter jets assigned to the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group, including now retired Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Alex Dietrich, observed the object in question while conducting training over the Pacific Ocean approximately 30 miles off the coast of Mexico's Baja Peninsula. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My God. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Well, if there's like a thing, it's rotating. The description of the object in the now-released Range Fowler report describes it as such. Quote, it was solid white, smooth, with no edges. It was uniformly colored with no nacelles, pylons, or wings. It was approximately 46 feet in length. Close quote. Fravor, among others, has also claimed publicly that the Tic Tac demonstrated highly unusual flight characteristics and other properties. And no firm explanation has been provided to date as to what the Tic Tac actually was. The object was famously captured on video during that spat of incidents using the advanced targeting forward-looking infrared systems on one of the F-A-18 Hornets. In 2022, the annual report on unidentified aerial phenomena that was released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the 2022 annual report on unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs, which is a broad category for reporting observed but unexplained sights in the sky. The report includes the work of All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or AARO, which originally was created within the Department of Defense in 2020. UAPs can occur at sea, in space, or on land. The executive summary showed UAP reporting is increasing, enabling a greater awareness of the airspace and increased opportunity to resolve UAP events. In addition to the 144 UAP reports covered during the 17 years of UAP reporting included in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence preliminary assessment, there have been 247 new reports and another 119 that were either since discovered or reported after the preliminary assessment's time period. This totals 510 UAP reports as of 30 August 2022. Additional information is provided in the classified version of this report. AARO and the ODNI assesses that the observed increase in the UAP reporting rate is partially due to a better understanding of the possible threats that UAP may represent, either as safety of flight hazards or as potential adversary collecting platforms, and partially due to reduced stigma surrounding UAP reporting. Section 6803 establishes a science plan for studies, evaluations, and applications of UAP. This simply acknowledges further secret research and development on UAP will continue to be performed as it has been ongoing for decades. 
However, this has led to the media and general ufology outlets claiming that their efforts have resulted in public accountability and ultimately disclosure. Whereas if you read the fine print, this is not the case. A recent article by Adam Mann on August the 3rd, 2022 in Scientific American writes, NASA's unexpected UAP announcement is perhaps a bit less surprising in hindsight. The agency's current administrator, former astronaut and senator Bill Nelson, told reporters last year that he was sure U.S. pilots who reported mysterious encounters, quote, saw something and their radars locked onto it, unquote. After all, these unidentified objects, if they exist, might be terrestrial in origin perhaps constituting evidence of an advanced Russian or Chinese aerospace technology rather than anything from beyond Earth. NASA's study is aimed at categorizing data from Earth-observing satellites and other monitoring instruments that may have picked up some sliver of information relevant to such phenomena to see if there is anything whatsoever the agency can say about their nature. NASA already collects extensive information about the atmosphere, such as Terra, Tsunami National Polar Orbiting Partnership, the NPP, and CloudSat, any of which may have picked up incidental data that could help identify UAPs. The Galileo Project has recently finished assembling its first telescope instruments on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory, which will begin capturing data in the coming weeks that might speak to the reality of UAPs or not. Earlier this month, the collaboration held its first in-person conference where Loeb presented the team's initial year of progress and plans for the future. There are also 10 scientific papers in preparation from different team members regarding the workings of their telescope, which will be publicly available after they go through peer review. Dr. Eric Davis Eric Davis, who worked as a consultant for the Pentagon, has his own interpretation of any disclosure event. Quote, no such thing as coordinated, uncoordinated, planning, or unplanned. It is a salesman's pitch. That is how they sell their books and sell their special events." Unquote. Dr. Christopher Green, Forensic Neuroimaging Expert The following is a quote taken from the work of Keith Blasterfield R.E. Dr. Green. If we hadn't suspected Markov had been murdered by the KGB, says Green, his death would have likely been written off as cause unknown or death from natural causes. But because Green and his CIA colleagues had a strong hypothesis to work from, they went the extra mile in the laboratory. Quote, our intelligence services found a tiny plutonium iridium pellet in Markov's legs and removed it. We prescribed specialized blood tests and identified ricin, which we looked for because of the victim's signs and symptoms. An assassin used a weapon disguised as an umbrella, close quote, says Green. For his work, breaking this and other forensic medical cases over the next five years, Green was awarded the National Intelligence Medal. In 2016, he was asked to join a classified science advisory board for James R. Clapper, then director of national intelligence, to whom the directors of all 17 U.S. intelligence agencies and organizations report, and the man who, in the 1990s, as director of DIA, criticized the anomalous mental phenomena programs, calling them, quote, just too far out at the leading edge of technology, close quote. Kit Green finds advising the Defense Department and intelligence community stimulating and challenging, he says. But what interests him the most is his work for 11 years now in his private practice, quote, I'm interested in the notion of people injured physically by anomalous events, closed quote, Green tells me. 
quote, often these events are perceived as unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAP, or drones, high energy radio frequencies that confront people face to face and cannot be explained, close quote. In an earlier age, some UAPs were known as UFOs. Green does not agree with the use of this term, quote, because it's imprecise, close quote, he says. But the nomenclature change helps to designate the research. Hillary Clinton spoke of UAPs while on the 2016 campaign trail. The impetus of Green's work can be tracked back to an unresolved component of the CIA's psychic research program in late 1974. The notion of people touched by anomalous events was a concept that Green had first confronted when working with Yuri Geller and the nuclear scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. These individuals carried top secret clearances that were as high as mine, says Green, including Q clearances for nuclear secrets, and yet they told me they saw things that could not be easily explained. They reported seeing raven-like birds on their bedposts, orbs floating down the hallways of their homes, a disembodied arm hovering in the air. These individuals were not crazy, he says. To paranormalists, these close contact sightings are known as close encounters. The idea of close encounters touches upon a lot of pathologies, says Green, but not all encounters involve pathologies. This mystery plagued him for decades, he says. In 2005, he began working on a research project to address this enigma. He began creating, quote, a structured database of individuals that were suffering enigmatic injuries, burns, skin lesions, cancers, diseases, and who also had face-to-face -face encounters with UAPs, close quote, says Green. We would comb through each narrative, remembers Green, compare statistics, pare the information down, pull out the people with pathologies. What was left? Many very interesting cases, cases that could not be easily explained. After two years of data analysis in 2007, Green took his research project from academic to operational. I began performing much pro bono work, he says. Forensic investigation and diagnosis of patients injured by multiple witnessed physical anomalous events with UAPs, drones, and other visible physical devices. Green accepted his patients carefully. They are all high-functioning individuals, many prodigious savants, most of whom carry a high security clearance, he says. They are members of special forces, members of the intelligence community, employees of aerospace companies, officers in the military, guards of military bases, policemen. Often injuries take place in a military bivouac, which is an overnight mission at a secure location for the purposes of guarding, reconnaissance, or some kind of exploration. Common injuries are from something that is airborne, something that emits some kind of a light or beam, some orb. Grabbing hold of a tiger's tail. Emerging cognitive neuroscience and related technologies. It's called the Military Intelligence Methodology for Emergent Neurophysiological and Cognitive Neuroscience Research in the next two decades. The intelligence community faces voluminous amounts of scientific information produced and available on a global scale. To improve the analysis of the information, the Technology Warning Division of the Defense Intelligence Agency's Defense Warning Office asked the National Research Council in 2004 to establish the Committee on the Defense Intelligence Agency Technology Forecast and Reviews. The DIA requested that the NRC establish a Standing Committee on Technology, Insight, Gauge, Evaluate, and Review. It's called Tiger. The Special Tiger Study Committee, headed by Bigelow advisor Dr. Eric Davis's colleague, former CIA analyst and assistant national intelligence officer for science and technology, 
Dr. Christopher Kit Green. Counted among its many notable members, Dr. John Gannon, former chairman of the CIA National Intelligence Council. The goals for the study were laid out at the National Academies of Science. This study will develop approaches to identification of trends in neurophysiological and cognitive neuroscience research that may help the U.S. intelligence community anticipate the state of such research internationally in the year 2007 and especially to help prepare for possible implications affecting future U.S. warfighting capabilities. The report serves as an example of why the U.S. Air Force and certain Tiger team members might have an interest in exploring the possibility of directly introducing mental impressions. The ability to shut down other sensory functions of the human brain is certainly of direct military interest, even if the phenomenology behind the effect is not well understood. An Ultimate Weapon Messers, Mellon, and Elizondo are both well-known names in the study of UAP. Their efforts to bring increased public awareness and greater transparency to the subject were pivotal in bringing about the Pentagon's release and confirmation of the FLIR, the Gimbal, and Go Fast videos taken by the flight crews of the USS Nimitz and the USS Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carriers. Also, the Preliminary Assessment Unidentified Aerial Phenomena report published by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in June 2021. The most important details in this text are that the U.S. is developing an ultimate weapon and that Mellon and Elizondo are making two stories, disclosure plus mounting of a deterrent. Corbell is just there to play the role of conduit for, quote, plausible denial, close quote. This unique situation suggests possession of an ultimate weapon without letting them know anything, which is ideal for such a weapon. The ultimate weapon is a weapon that gives such an advantage that no one has a way to defend it. To make it a deterrent, the quote unquote enemy must never acquire the certainty of the weapon's existence. To do this, it is necessary to make the information as presented to raise a lot of doubt as well as to make any beginning of scientific research politically untenable by the enemy. This can be done by passing the techno for the UFO phenomenon spreading the idea that the U.S. has recovered materials or creating the possibility of a highly advanced weaponry in the intelligence community. This can also kill in the egg the research required to duplicate it due to the ridiculousness, the taboo that will always remain. If the ultimate weapon existed, it would provide a second type of deterrent complementary to the atomic bomb. It is impossible for the enemy to prove they don't have it, so it would be foolish not to seize this opportunity. There is this theory that it doesn't work so well, but Australian declassified documents substantially criticize the findings of the Condon Report. We know the Russians are interested in the subject. Now, the Chinese even more. That's not what will distract them from the research, but it can deter a little from attacking very hard. The problem is, it comes at a price. Militarizing research on the UFO phenomenon, using it for deterrence, can only completely sterilize scientific research. How can we be sure what is being picked up on radar and other sources is not man-made? For instance, a recent article from Forbes May 11, 2020 states that, quote, the U.S. Navy has patented technology to create mid-air images to fool infrared and other sensors. This builds on many years of laser plasma research and offers a game-changing method of protecting aircraft from heat-seeking missiles. 
It may also provide a clue about the source of some recent UFO sightings by military aircraft. A more sophisticated approach uses an intense, ultra-short, self-focusing laser pulse to create a glowing filament or channel of plasma, an effect discovered in the 1990s known as laser-induced plasma filaments, or LIPF. These can be created at some distance from the laser for tens or hundreds of meters. Because LIPFs conduct electricity, they have been investigated as means of triggering lightning or creating a lightning gun. Then again, could there be other reasons to suggest what else may be going on? This from the Naval Information Warfare Center. System and method for laser-induced plasma for infrared homing missile countermeasure. A method where a laser beam is configured to generate a laser-induced plasma filament and the LIPF acts as a decoy to detract a homing missile or other threat from a specific target. Alongside this, the following from the same source. Method and apparatus for laser-induced plasma filaments for agile counter-directed energy weapon applications. The method comprises the steps of propagating an infrared laser pulse in air, self-focusing the laser pulse until it reaches a critical power density and creating a plasma column. This creates a clamping effect on the intensity of the pulse, which causes the laser pulse to defocus and plasma to be created. The laser pulse maintains a small beam diameter and high peak intensity over large distances, creating a polarity of plasma columns, creating a parallel linear array, and using the array to deflect an incident energy. In the meantime, Apparently, ideas can be grand. The Pentacle Memorandum has been a controversial item since its existence was revealed to the wider UFO community by Dr. Jacques Vallée. In his excellent work, Forbidden Science, Vallée found the two-page memo in 1967 while working with Dr. J. Allen Hynek's papers and partially described it in Forbidden Science, giving the author of the memo's code name, Pentacle. It has been reported that, quote, it would not be until 1992 that word of this secret document came to light with the release of Vallée's four volume series titled Forbidden Science. Not long after this, a purported leaked copy of the Pentacle Memorandum came into the possession of UFO researchers, and Valet would confirm that this was the very same document he had seen back in 1967. The document would end up hitting the public with a whimper, not creating nearly the sort of uproar that Valet had been expecting. Most people just didn't really seem to care all that much. Even within UFO circles, it got mixed response, with some sharing Valet's alarmist and paranoid interpretation, while others said the document was not particularly significant in the grand scheme of things. Still, others took the more extreme stance that the document, quote, proved, close quote, that the government was behind the whole UFO phenomena, and that there were no aliens or spaceships just a large-scale PSYOPs scheme. All of these various interpretations have managed to make the Pentacle Memorandum a controversial and much-debated document right up to the present, with no general agreement on what it all means or what implications it might have. It remains an odd footnote in the history of ufology that we may never truly understand for certain its implications unknown to us. Ideas can be even more grand, just like the following. 
how the DOD and CIA propose to execute a fake second coming of Jesus Christ to overthrow Castro is revealed by Assistant Deputy Director for National Intelligence Programs Thomas A. Perot in his 1974 report to the United States Senate. On November 30, 1961, a second attempt to overthrow the Cuban dictator commenced. It was called Operation Mongoose and was led by U.S. Air Force General Edward Lensdale of the United States Department of Defense. Lensdale worked closely with the Central Intelligence Agency to implement the 32 individual phases of Operation Mongoose. The end goal was the overthrow of Castro. Lansdale's plan consisted of spreading the word that the second coming of Christ was imminent and that Christ was against Castro, who was anti-Christ. And you would spread this word around Cuba and then on whatever date it was, that there would be a manifestation of this thing. And at the time, just over the horizon, there would be an American submarine that would surface off of Cuba and send up some star shells. And this would be the manifestation of the second coming and Castro would be overthrown. Star shells are powerful pyrotechnic flares designed to fill the skies at night with widespread illumination. Perot reported to the Senate that Lansdale intended for a U.S. Navy submarine to project images of Jesus Christ onto low-lying clouds off the coast of the Cuban capital of Havana. While the images of Christ appeared over Havana, a crew from a U.S. military plane, camouflaged by the clouds and using a new technology to muffle the plane's engines, would broadcast messages from Jesus Christ over a loudspeaker to the people of Cuba in Spanish, of course, ordering them by the authority of God himself to overthrow Castro, the Antichrist, and renounce communism. The U.S. Air Force has long been associated with all things ET, presumably part of a reverse engineering mandate to make operational suspected or observed anomalous phenomena. The Air Force and other services have a long history of injecting phenomena that are not scientifically understood into active operational programs. The best known example being the Stargate Psychic Spy programs. Apparently, understanding the theoretical basis for an observed anomaly is not a prerequisite for obtaining operational funding. It is important to ask why a threat narrative may exist. Is it to receive more funding? To profit off of the UFO topic in some sort of way? To profit off of and gain control and access to technologies that may be better off in the hands of the public? Many decades ago, Werner von Braun's mentor, Hermann Obert, the founding father of rocketry and aeronautics, also known as the father of spaceflight, stated his belief that flying saucers are real and that, quote, they are spaceships from another solar system. I think that they possibly are manned by intelligent observers who are members of a race that may have been investigating our Earth for centuries, close quote. He wrote these words in Flying Saucers Come From a Distant World, the American Weekly, October 24th, 1954. At the time, academics like Aubert were well aware of the UFO phenomenon. Apparently, Braun was the one who first warned of a false flag alien invasion. This was expressed by Carol Rosen. Rosen was the first female corporate manager of Fairchild Industries, a space and missile defense consultant who has worked with various operations, government departments, and intelligence communities. She worked closely with Werner von Braun shortly before his death, specifically on the subject of space-based weapons. According to Rosen, the threat narrative would be attached to the UFO phenomenon for the purpose of building space-based weapons. Stated by Carol Rosen herself, a quote from Werner von Braun. And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. 
we're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. Thanks for watching and we hope this video was able to engage you critical thinkers into action. Working together, we believe it will all come down to us to gather the information, study the data, develop conclusions, and deliver the truth to the world. History has shown that when information is presented to the public to uncover the truth, we deliver every time. Hello everyone and welcome back to Phenomenon Radio and this, the post-show panel and commentary portion of the program. What a, an interesting second show for all of you this week. Um, you know, the first official air, uh, episode aired two weeks ago and our original plan is to air two, two real-time shows a month. So there'll be one drop every other week, bi-weekly. And um, I really think it was well-received. And, uh, you know, I want to give a huge thank you to all of you who subscribed to our new YouTube channel. Um, I want to send a huge thank you to all of you. And so many awesome folks migrated over from Professor Simon's channel. Uh, you can find his channel at youtube.com at Professor Simon. And uh, he has some awesome subscribers. And so many of them came over. They gave us a like. We're, we're like at 900 now, just after two weeks. So, you know, the, the channel is off and running. And I want to send a huge thank you from myself, John Burroughs, and James Warrell, the rest of the team, to Professor Simon. Uh, for his awesome support and very, very kind promotion of us on his platform. And uh, so we want to extend a personal thank you to him for his amazing support. I need to mention uh, just very quickly that uh, Phenomenon Remastered Classics are going to air in the middle of those bi-weekly real-time shows from now. Uh, so you won't miss any content uh, on the channel. Matter of fact, the channel is sequencing the original Phenomenon radio show. So each one will air or be uploaded. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be uh, bi-weekly. These shows are going to be popping in there um, just on the regular, like maybe two or three a week. Uh, because we have four full seasons of Phenomenon Radio's original shows that ran from 2015 to 2019. And so those will be popped up on the channel as well for content for you to go back, listen to, research, add to your files uh, the audio tracks. Because you can go to Spreaker.com on the Unex Network Spreaker page. You can also find them on Spotify and and iheart and google podcast apple podcast these phenomenon radio remastered classics will be vital to anyone with an interest in the subject of ufos especially the bentwater rents rental some incident and uh and and various other content so you can download those in mp3 form and add those to your on-demand libraries for research and and historical purposes in fact those were, those were John Burroughs and Linda Moulton Howe, and I produced them for them and, and did the voice work for all of them, and, uh, and they were really great shows. So we're building on those four seasons with this new version of Phenomenon Radio and weaponizing UAP. 
So I wanted to let you all know that, that, you know, every other week will be a real time show, a new show. And in between those shows on the radio platform at unxnetwork.com on Friday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, there will be an audio version of the remastered classics in those off weeks for you. So they'll always be there for you on the radio side. And then we'll have the videos for you on the YouTube channel side. Uh, so with that, you're all caught up on the YouTube channel, youtube.com at phenomenon radio show. We'll have all this stuff in the descriptions for you down below. Um, so make sure you check out that down below, um, with those classics and all that information, we want to get, uh, the team in here for all of you. So let's welcome the team, John Burroughs, James Laro, and the, the amazing professor Stein. Welcome gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Let me make sure I got everything right here. I think I do. Um, Everybody, uh, it, it's hard to believe that it's been two weeks since I've seen you last, <laughs> you know, but this, the time just goes by so fast and so many awesome things, uh, have taken place between, uh, the, the show two weeks ago and now, and, uh, you know, after discussions with John Burroughs, he wanted to lead off tonight with the amazing video that professor Simon dropped. Um, you know, regarding the Calvine UFO photo, which <laughs> was, it was amazing professor. And, uh, and I just want to, I just want to be the first one to say you did a really interesting job, really good job, really interesting research. And, um, you know, most of the people on the feed, uh, I wrote a small article about it and dropped it and, and was talking about what you did. And most of the feedback that I've gotten has been very positive. And that being the most likely explanation for what happened. How was the uh, response then for you? Uh, yeah, really interesting. One of the things about my channel is that I actually, uh, you know, have experts who get in touch. And usually after posting a video, people will actually say interesting things. And I think the two... Um, most interesting people who got in touch were, of course, uh, Nick Pope, who kind of made this classic statement of, well, we can't do that. We can't confirm it, but we can't deny it. You know, which is, oh, what does that mean? Come on, Nick, I think he knows. And I got a lovely letter from um, Ron Evans, uh, Mr. Green Glow himself, who worked at BAE Systems, and he pointed me and you, you as a team towards the fact that it could be this um, radar targeting thing for the stealth project that was going on at, by Marconi at BAE Systems at the time. So, yeah, he, he kind of thought it was an interesting concept. Um, very funny, uh, the kids who now work at BAE None of them were actually around in 1990 because they're all 10. No, they're, they're wonderful. And they, they didn't remember anything to do with the Calvine incident in particular, but they, um, they wondered, in fact, they hardly knew that the BA at the time had Harriers. And that, I think, is the key because I, way <laughs> back when I did the original films, drew a blank with NATO, the RAF, the Fleet Air Arm, the Royal Navy, Germany, anybody who was actually flying in the military operational area of the Highlands in, in a Harrier in, on, in August 1990. And then, that was the key, um, you know, there's two private ones owned by a contractor who was working on stealth technology. So in the classic way that we're discussing here, the weaponization of stuff, um, I thought that's the story, you know. Metamaterial could lead, and I think it could just lead and be the answer, one answer to what, what they were actually testing at Calvine. Uh, who knows? It's a mystery. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's good reporting like that that, that is going to 
it's going to see the door open yeah. for other possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, one of the possibilities I'm looking at right now, just in the research phase, um, is, is the shape uh, of the, obviously, the object that's been photographed. Right. Um, and we only sort of stumbled upon it recently, but um, it's a possible, possible um, its shape is defined due um, to its need for data collection for LIDAR and radar calibration. Um, now, the, the idea that, you know, your, your craft are flying around it as well also could potentially give give a good reason for that, you know, its actual shape. Um, in, and it was something similar to what uh, Ron Evans uh, was dis trying to discuss, but I didn't think he was very, he didn't really want to go too far down that path. Right. Um, by, you know, the um, there's, there's certain angles on things and there's certain shapes that you can actually test your radars and your signals coming from your aircraft on, you know, and to, to, to literally calibrate your LIDAR and your radars on, 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 on all systems that are in, within the area or with, on whatever they want to make sure is working, working okay. Right. Yeah, and that's not that's not to mention that could have been a ground radar station that was looking at the both of them at the time. Right. But you know, the interesting thing from the video, one thing that really captured me was how, Professor, you presented the the Nighthawk, um, and its faceted and angled designs on the body of the plane. Right. And how that object in that picture looked. It right. looked a great deal, just like that. Right, 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 and and thanks very much to John to pointing out that the um, the original stealth fighter you know, was so fragile you don't touch it. I mean, it li literally lived in an air conditioned, uh, you know, pre conditioned hangar, and they spent all night maintenance fixing it because the surface had to be perfect and that was the key i think marconi was working on an advanced skin um for probably an american project that they were getting money for to make it less for make it less fragile and the dates are perfect for that yeah john what do you think yeah well, Nick used the classic I can either cut from or deny, which means it's classified. That's basically what he's telling <laughs> you, Professor. But Nick oh, likes okay. to use that all the time, you know. He, maybe he knows, maybe he doesn't. But I guess getting back to my point is is that we're going to discuss this further, you know, on show two, too. But the big question to me is where have we learned how to develop these materials from? What what is, what is the government and the scientists been studying to advance our technology? You know, so when you have these UFO people that you know don't particularly like us to talk about some of the stuff as far as what we're seeing in the sky could be terrestrial, you have to wonder that is the fact that I mean, we may not have a, a UFO in a hangar, but a lot of our technology may be. Uh, developed or has been developed off of mm. uap technology all you have to do is look at a couple of angles the foia i got professor which would have fit well in your um presentation was when the right. MOD stated to me that they couldn't discuss what they have developed off uap technology because it belonged to you know defense contractors so yeah. They are, mm -hmm. they are definitely the defense contractors are controlling this stuff and they're hiding a lot of this stuff. And then the hearings themselves in D.C., when it was asked by a particular congressman asking, have, has this altered or helped enhance our, um, our own defense or offensive capabilities? And the, the individual that was questioned, answered the question by that goes behind closed doors. So mm -hmm. they're clearly working on technology that's being advanced from UAP technology. And the, the big question is how far back does this go and where is, right. is where is things, how to tie this all together, which is what we're trying to do in this uh, series that we're putting together. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. right. I, uh, I want to move. That was a very good video for uh, all of the viewers out there that happened to see this that didn't come from professors. 
Facebook page, uh, YouTube page, YouTube channel. Run over there to his channel and check it out. There's there's going to be links below for for that video. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Simon. Oh no, yeah, I, I, it's got a lot of interest. Uh, the only people who really didn't kind of like it was David Clark, who <laughs> and his team. Um, I reached out to them to see if we could see any resolution on the aircraft, which really does look like a Harrier, either this 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 Harrier variant and also the BAE system Harriers had uh, checkerboard um, optical marks on them. But they they you know, they they say that uh, that they can't see that level of detail uh, on it because that would <clears throat> I think that would really nail it. I think if we, typical me, if we look at the big picture, you know, Ooh, there's, you know, what's the elephant in the room? What's the gorilla, the weird UFO? Hang on a minute. You know, why is there a Harrier? You know, look, <laughs> look at the big picture. Where is it? Oh, it's in the Scottish low-level military training area. Ooh. And, yeah. you know, th things like that. If we if we can crack the Harrier, we might crack the weird yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And that's I the way know. photo analysts work. That's right. the way it works. Even satellite imagery, all of that. You know, they look for right. smaller details to zero themselves in on the real issue. Now, oh, good yeah. the, the, uh, at the end of the day, um, I really think that the, these anomalies in the case, the, the witnesses never came forward and they never have been named. And right. the story was never dropped in the paper. Um, these are all telltale signs that the government doesn't mm. want you to know what's going on. And right. it's classic disinformation going on where there was a lot of people who made comments about the fact that this object supposedly just boomed straight up out of sight. Well, who said that? Right. right. That's what I, that's what I've been answering them all with. Who said that? That's because, well, precisely. That's what I this you you wrote obviously wrote the same answer as me because what we can only go on is the photograph. Okay, there might be a report and there might be witnesses who saw it, but I I don't know, and we've got no evidence that it moved at all because there's only one picture. It would be great. Supposedly there's half a dozen. If only we had two, then we could see you know we could see apparent motion. But yeah. To focus on, it zoomed up into the sky. Well, yeah, that, that's really? My point. We don't know. Where's, where's the other five images that would show that, right. that, that that UFO was sitting still while the plane was moving around? Okay. Right. Um, right. It, you know, right. the, the testimony we've been given has been given to us by the MOD, not right. by the witnesses. We have never had the freedom to right. interview those witnesses ourselves go back and interview them again, compare those responses, compare those answers to find out any details in the, you know, in the, in, in between the lines. Um, right. So, you know, that part of that story is, is null in my opinion, but mm -hmm. the fact that it, that, that, you know, their names are going to be withheld till 2076. Right. You right. know, that whole shit never flies with me. The president's right. brain and all this information is going to be locked away for 75 years until right. everybody involved right. is dead and gone. Right. That's the and idea. And their kids are on their way to the, right. you know, the, the, the funeral home. Um, that, that just screams. It screams government guilt. It just screams right. military cover-up. And so that that just fuels the fire for me that it was a uap that it was not i mean not a, a an alien vehicle but it indeed is a right an unidentified right. object it's more like a ufo than a uap there's no phenomenon to it um right. anomalous yeah. to it other than we don't you know most people don't know what it is and you know i'm all for secrecy there's most sure. of the people in this country uh not speaking for yours or anyone else's but i wouldn't want them knowing any of our secrets either um, right. you know, but, uh, it was a fantastic video. And well, as John said, the, you know, the, a lot of the government 
freedom of information hides be behind uh, commercial licenses and patents of uh, you know of, of private contractors. Right, and that, second, I, yeah. and as I kind of said, I that was the scam really you know for a government not to give away secrets oh it's it's a patent held by marconi or whoever and they don't have to tell you the truth that's right that's right, right. and you know love them or hate them philip corso colonel philip corso was the one who really kind of brought that notion to light in the in the in the public ufology circles over here oh, in yeah. the united states especially with his story uh, of, of having a file cabinet in his office sent to him from General Trudeau, his boss, uh, you know, with all this UFO technology and, and files and, and, and all this back work in it. Um, right. They just handed it off to the private sector and let them go with it. So they would right. have to handle all the security measures. They would get the funding and they would get all the support they needed and the government would reap all the benefits. And... Um, Howard Hughes and so many others are evidence of it. But, uh, you know, to get to get to this show, moving forward to the program that we just aired for all of you tonight, uh, we began in the Pacific. The Nimitz Carrier Strike Group was mm. uh, on maneuvers off the coast of uh, Southern California, San Diego out there, 30 miles or so. And... Uh, they were there for several days and the radar operator of the Princeton with whom John Burroughs broke, uh, that witness on radio for the first time in history, uh, oh, yeah. Kevin, chief petty officer, Kevin day, right. uh, on phenomenon radio on the original phenomenon radio show. And, and, uh, that interview was very compelling to hear what this, this man had to say. He was the chief radar officer, uh, uh, you know, of the, 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 the strike group. And, uh, you know, most people don't understand that, you know, the radars on aircraft carriers, they're not really meant to reach out a, a, a super great distance. They're for flying planes and taking off planes and the immediate area around them. That radar on the Princeton man could reach way out. Right. And he right. testified to us, not right. testified, but he commented to us and told us his testimony on the radio show that he saw these objects for days way out there on the perimeter of their reach mm. that were just right. sitting there. They weren't doing anything threatening. They weren't doing anything aversive or, you know, like they was doing nothing radical or anything like that. And if it doesn't pre present an immediate threat to the strike group, they don't worry about it. They're out there in maneuvers and training, and they're doing their thing. And as long as the airspace well, that they're working in is clear, they don't right. have to worry about it. Until he presented to, uh, you know, to some higher ups that he thought they needed to be looked at, and that's when they sent David Fravor and another plane out to go take a look and see what these things were. Now, right. guys, here's where I want to get your opinion. Now. Fravor was the first FA-18 on the scene with one of these objects. And he's the one who called back to the, to the strike group that he was engaged. And yeah. he, and he said that on the interview on phenomenon radio with Linda Moulton, how John Burroughs, uh, he said that he said that, I, you know, cause I remember him and asking him like, you know, why did you say you were in, being engaged? And he was like, because of these radical maneuvers, this thing was doing around my plane. Like it literally like barrel rolled right over my plane. Like, and he, he was like, it was an evasive maneuver in, in the front of us. And, and so I, I diagnosed that as being engaged. And so it made these radical maneuvers and then it descended down to the surface of the water. And then he did a corkscrew maneuver to go down, keeping an eye on it while his planes turned and just followed it down to where it was. Now, my question is that one that was submitted to by our viewers to all of us about is it possible for the US military to engage its own its own strike group. John, I'm going to lead off with you on this one. Do you think it's possible that the US military some agency in the military complex could be testing something that it has on the Nimitz strike group out there? in the Pacific well, without them knowing about it. 
Well, let's start with this. Go back in history and look at how many times advanced, well, I shouldn't say advanced weaponry like we're dealing with now, but just different weapon systems and different things that they've tested on soldiers and different stuff that, you know, came out declassified years later. Just you can go back to just the, the nuclear weapons testing that they did on soldiers up in the desert in Vegas, the Vegas area where they were out there and they were exposed to the radiation. So, yeah. And also what makes sense, if you look at the Nimitz, first of all, that was the first time the new sensors had been upgraded, the radars, the sensors, and they were also flying with the new helmet. That's obviously advanced since then, but it was the new helmet that that could control, has more control with the pilot and stuff. So you had that, that going on with the fact that you had the new equipment that was being tested in the area um that also happened off the east coast too i don't remember what aircraft carrier group it was before they deployed but that was another upgrade of equipment and you were in training areas so when right. when Faber said he engaged he didn't engage the way they normally would he engaged without weapons because they weren't armed but you would not want if you were testing equipment and this would be the defense contractors not the navy itself you would want to, to not have the pilots know what they were doing, how they would react to the equipment, what they would do and everything else, and how they would respond. One of the things that I caught interesting off this latest UFO flap was, I believe, I don't know what his rank was, but we'll just call him, uh, he was a Navy pilot, Graves, that was involved in one of the incidents, said the F-18 is not equipped to handle this type of technology. So they're clearly pushing his group is pushing for a more advanced technology other than fighter planes. But at the end of the day, if, for example, which everybody conveniently overlooked, even though in one aspect ufology says, well, pilots are the best trained to identify this stuff. When one of the videos said that there was a fleet of drones, no one wanted to acknowledge that. They wanted to prove right. that and say, well, they must be mistaken. But ultimately, if you're trying to test equipment and see how our equipment reacts, which the Americans and the British have the best radars and you know advanced equipment that are being built in the world. Maybe next to the China, you'd have to test it on our own equipment to see how it works. Right. right. What about you, James? <clears throat> well, I say I agree with every, pretty much everything John said because it's obviously things that we've discussed uh, amongst ourselves for for a while now. <laughs> Forever. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't doubt what he's obviously what he said, but um, I do wonder about the circumstances surrounding uh, these incidents. I, I really do. Um, if it was, if if everything was so straightforward, then things wouldn't be as confused as they seem to be. You know, and that rings a bell straight away. If if there's too many, again, there's too many questions uh, that need answering. But obviously, we we can't really answer them because if. If anything, as we said, was being conducted there, that would be in private hands, and there's no way of actually being able to verify that, right, right. Um, unless you, right. you know, if you get a whistleblower. You know. So the best thing we can do is maybe look at what is out there, you know, and in, in, is there anything that we have that could produce anything that they may have seen? For instance, um, the the gimbal footage. Um, I've been looking at that for as much as everyone else has, you know. But again, with me, when I look at the actual movement of the craft itself, that does, uh, and when I really highlight the, this glow around it, it does suggest to me that there's some kind of plasma actuators um, giving off what they call a glow of plasma, which is helping the, whatever's in between just literally do that and do that and fly against the wind. Because this, whatever this, this, they needed. They've been it, they've been testing it for years, you know, on few, uh, the wings of airplanes and everything like that. But I've now got some documentation showing that there is potentially a reason on why this thing could potentially do that at the time. And the paper that I've got comes from 2003 at the moment. But again, I need to dig deeper into right. that now. But right. I just need to make sure that what we're we're we're, we're being told told the truth, basically. Some you know, kind of that, harmonic that, balancing. Can I can I add to that for a second, Ray? You, you got your girlfriend there with you, John? Uh, it's my cat. She seems to be a, a me too. A, a, a hound, you know. A, a, she's a, wanting a, to be on on the. She's wanting to get on yeah. TV. Yeah, but anyway, get to my point. A couple of things stand out. Okay, 
first of all, that those videos that were released are grainy. They're hard to read, right? Yeah, yeah. The Calvin yeah. picture was grainy. It's hard to read. So you can't get the full picture. That was, I think, done by attention, you know, purposely. Then you also have the fact that when, through investigations, people got Kevin Day to admit that the radars that on the Princeton could be manipulated with countermeasures so right. that the radar right. itself could be manipulated to see something that's not going on or, you know, right. some of the things they said, the speed that was taking place, the radar picked it up as this. Well, countermeasures can cause some of that. Uh, Favor admitted that the uh, helmet was being utilized at that point when I asked him point blank. And so you have the concept, too, of military people that have to be careful what they say or bring up because that radar system being being able to be manipulated is most likely not something they want to admit or talk very much about, never mind a new helmet and all this new technology. And if, being you, don't mind, and if you don't mind me saying the spooking of radars is, isn't anything new. That's been they've been right, right. trying to speak right up for for a number numbers of years to confuse the enemy. So it's nothing new. It's just advanced in in what it wants to do and what it needs to. You know. But maybe they're doing it themselves. I mean, um, Catalina Island and the other part of that military operational area is the biggest Navy defense simulation. And almost all uh, radar systems, um, radar rooms inside, and aircraft can be switched over to training. And um, objects and radar points can be injected into the radar. You know, imagine it's three o'clock in the morning and you're tracking an inbound um, flight from Honolulu to San Diego. You're pretty bored and then somebody switches off the on the simulator and all these UAPs, are, you know, and you, you, you have to treat it like real. It's fantastic psychological training. And that's what they do, you know. Um, it, is it real? But they did see something with their eyeballs and with forward-looking infrared radar. Here's the possible thing that I'm really focusing on is real optical simulation, laser-induced plasma countermeasures. I mean, if you, you know, I'm sure F-18 pilots in the Navy fly up in a simulation to a height to intercept something on their radar screen, which is only on their radar screen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they flew up and there's a glowing thing? And, oh, hang on, the glowing thing can defy the laws of physics and move faster than a real airplane. Because it's not an airplane. I don't know. <laughs> it, 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 it's a possibility. And when we get close to it, it may affect uh, the, um, the 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 equipment on, on the aircraft itself. Well, it goes right. even deeper than that, guys. When I did a radio show with Kevin Day one time, we were, he was talking about how it could be our technology. And, and, right. and he said, let's say it was, he said, then if the pilots would have been armed, which they weren't because it was a training exercise, oh. they, he said there's a possibility they would have, they felt threatened enough, they may have launched a missile at it. And he said, if that missile, if it would have been a countermeasure, would have, you know, it would have missed it, which, oh, by the way, that goes back to time dilation. And the, the uh, missile would have been active seeking out another target to include <laughs> the airplane that actually launched it could be that target. And I and said, isn't that right. an amazing countermeasure? And here's the other thing that can come up. Let's say um, the fleet itself, this is, they were already utilizing new sensors, new radars, a new helmet, mm. and they weren't even aware of all the stuff they could do. But let's say we go a step farther, afterwards they get debriefed and they get told, well, this is new stuff that we're working on. But if the story ever breaks, we're going to use a UFO you yeah. know, cover story, which has clearly happened over and over in different incidents. The, the, the governments love to have the UFO major come into it for, for different reasons just to take right. interest off of it and, and stop people from digging even deeper. Right. Right. Totally agree. Makes sense. I don't, I'll never forget David Fravor saying to us, um, I think we were you know, like in a commercial break, John, and, and he said that that helmet costs like sixty sixty five thousand dollars $65,000 just for that helmet. Mm. Well, that helmet now is advanced on the F-35. They can control an armada outside the airplane of 
drones, weapons, and everything else right. that can be launched from a C-17. Isn't that unreal? And that pilot, as a matter of fact, I think they've gotten to the point now where they said it's almost pilot overload with the amount of stuff that they have to control, including the airplane. But obviously the airplane itself is no longer fly by wire, so it's controlled by a computer quite a bit of it anyway. But one other thing that I didn't bring up, okay, they've admitted now, just with what's going on in Ukraine, we now have drones that can self-learn, that can be independent of the ground operators, and it has AI in it that picks out targets. One of the things that you would want to do is train the drones on how to react to pilots and everything else to include if the technology was uploaded in these drones that they always go to, what did they call that, a strike point, James? Or what was the definition where they went to a spot after an event? I forget the terminology. The CAP, now. well, the CAP point it yes. was, was really important because, I mean, again, the big picture, why did the object go to a predetermined navy um oh, exactly. uh, point it's a it's the point where all the aircraft go back to 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 circle and muster before returning um one by one back to the ship so so if these drones were self-learning they would already right. know it because they'd be programmed or if they were being right. controlled from some kind of technology at catalina island they would already know they're going to a cap point and you don't point. know what's tracking the aircraft themselves because you have to take it to the next level. What kind of tracking would be being used by these drones to figure out what the next move of the aircraft is, especially if ah. they're being developed as countermeasures? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Advanced stuff. Sure, but we're there. I mean, they just, um, right. the National Reconnaissance Office, and I saw this come up last night, and I can't find the report. It's there. But they track some kind of tic-tac that they can't identify. Well, all our all our systems now are being are advanced more that they can start picking up more stuff in the sky. I mean, just look right. at the latest UFO incident where they claim they had to change the uh, NORAD systems to uh, right. to pick up different things. Well, that would also count count for different other technologies and the upgrades that are going on, and that's a key. But I still want to say, folks. We're not saying that this is all our own technology, period. We're saying that this is technology that we believe has been uh, developed off mm. a lot of times off of UAP technology. And thus, Possibly. the in the title, the weaponization of UAP, absolutely there is some sort of phenomenon that goes on around this world, this entire Earth, and has been since probably before us all. So... Uh, we have instruments that can detect physical objects that are maneuvering in our airspace under our waters and uh, on the ground and they change the environment they're in they're solid intelligently controlled objects and and you know we have admissible evidence to prove that so what they are and where they're from is what the civilian uh population would really like to probably know i would like to think we were all responsible enough and mature enough to handle that answer uh, if and when we ever get it. Um, but, you know, that remains to be seen. We all have this, uh, or I should say the majority, I think, of us that do this have been in it for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I think we all kind of have this understanding that uh, the government knows 40, 50, 60, 70 years more than we do. And that right. they know more about who's running these objects, who's piloting these objects and, and that. And so, you know, I think that's how come they're even included in this in the subject at all. They've got our money. They use it. And they use it wisely in a, in most instances, I would like to think. They waste a lot of it, but they have more answers. And so we keep them close to the vest and they play with us like pets and it's kind of comical once you get to that point in your research and your analysis of this subject um right you know that provides you that clarity that wait a minute just about everything and everyone we hear from in this subject is from intelligence agents disinformation agents you know jesse mm -hmm. marcel was an intelligence agent 
from 1947 and so on. Even Luis Elizondo, you know what I mean? Like, so Richard you know, Doty. And Richard right. Doty, he's the king of them, of, of the disinformation agents. Uh, right. Well, he certainly has been one of the most vocal ones, and he's come forward with a lot more stuff for us to to, to peck at, for sure. Oh, right. Richard. But, um, you know, we talked also, well, we talked, we covered uh, a lot in this program. So I think we're all under the impression that, I think the four of us all think, you know, that the U.S. government would test uh, platforms on itself to, to sort of see the response, the reaction, the capabilities and, and whatnot. Um, the, the, the ways and the means are always going to be there and, and they're going to covet those and protect those um, like the flesh on their skin. But the annual report on unidentified aerial phenomena that was released in 2022 by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence the executive summary showed that UAP reporting is increasing. Um, and it and they said that it enables greater awareness of the airspace and increases opportunity to resolve UAP events. Uh, James, what do you think that means? Well, it also lets them know where not to test something. <laughs> right. That's why you are who you are. Dang. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Let, let's let's find out where they're not looking. Which, right. which professor made a good point. Way out there off the the coast of uh, of of Baja Peninsula and and right. uh, you know and, and out there Catalina, there's nothing out there. Well, what a, a perfect military, place yeah, to no. go out there and test all your little naval goodies. I, I'm a private pilot, and you can. As John would know, you know, you, you, they publish notams of uh, when these areas are active. And you can look up WS, whatever it is, off San Diego, and it tells you exactly what they do there. It's from that area is extremely important. It's from subsea, so it includes, it includes submarines and craft that go underwater right up to space with live firing. And the other, the other thing that is, uh, I think what probably um, prompted them to go up and look eyeballs on these objects was from my experience that if little me in my Cessna strays into one of these MOAs, military operational areas, non-communicating with the controlling authority, they have to stop the exercise. Um, so when they had unidentified non-communicative uh, traffic in, you know, in, in the area, that was probably their excuse to launch an F-18 and let's actually go and see what it, what it was. Because you can't have um, advanced military exercises with non-communicative unidentified aircraft you know it could be anything couldn't it so i think that's what might have pro you know might have started the whole thing off yeah unless and, well i don't know you know it could have been a test <laughs> and most you know well i don't want to say most because i really don't i don't i'm not in a position to know i've talked to people before but i'm you know i'll just be repeating what they said but right. most, you know most types of major training events like that these pilots are unarmed unless they're oh, testing yeah. armament if they're testing it seems to me if they were testing armament they have no choice but to be armed right but if you're you know what a perfect time to test a platform out on an fa-18 or a group of them when they right. don't have any bullets you know what i mean so you know it just there's a lot of things that go into um these but it's also it's also secret. I mean, that's the thing. They had control over the boundaries of their operational area. So right. there was no commercial traffic. There was no eyes apart from space eyes looking at it. It was a closed system. So whatever happened in there, we don't know because it was it was active military operational area where they test stuff. Oh, and and all that's of it, where they saw the stuff. You know? And all of it is recorded. Every data point is recorded, what I'm assuming, from both ends, from the right. platform end and from the carrier group end. 
because right. you know to kevin day he he told us that he went down to go get the data tapes and they were gone they were blank uh, they had they right. had taken them and they had replaced them just that quick he was going to make calculations <clears throat> on how fast those objects fell from 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 height to the surface of the water I mean, it, it was his words that everybody quoted after Phenomenon Radio interview that these objects were raining down from the sky. Right. And once they got engaged, these things just dropped to the surface of the ocean in, in a second. And, um, right. it, you know, that's a, that's a phenomenon in itself when you think about it. But again, I really think... Uh, you know, this comes back to conversations I've had with John Burroughs for, since day one, really, about it. And that is what could be a better way to show your adversaries. And we talked about this in the show a little bit. Um, you know, what kind of tech that you have in your possession? What kind Quite. of what kind of platforms you have and what kind of maneuvers they can make? And right. You know, to hear uh, a decorated naval aviator say to you with complete confidence and directness that if this technology belongs to China or Russia or somebody else, we're in trouble. Right. And this 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 guy flew for the Black Aces, and these this, this squadron is no chump outfit. These guys know their shit. They know what they're doing. There are highly trained, uh, most highly trained pilots, uh, you know, in in this dogfight arena. And uh, man, when they say something like that, it really sends cold, ice cold blood through your veins for a minute. Uh, Actually, it just sends ching ching to me. <laughs> let's let's yeah. uh, we need more money to, to outdo the Chinese and, yeah yeah and, right. and the Russians right. but also um folks if you don't believe that there's uh, misinformation going out there go back to the Manhattan project the American government fed the Russians the wrong type of blueprints to develop their own nuclear weapon because they knew they were trying to do that themselves they already knew this stuff didn't work they'd already oh, wow. you know, w went down that path. They gave them these blueprints, and the Russians went down that avenue, and it took them an extra four years to develop their first nuclear bomb, where we actually had already knew that they didn't work, and we were on to um, we were on to what was going to work, which led to um, the two nuclear bombs being dropped on Japan. But you also have to look at something else that will go into further shows. Los, Los Alamos, I can't even say it right, in New Mexico was where the Manhattan Project took place. Some of our most advanced technology and non-lethal weapon stuff is being developed or has been developed at Los Alamos there. So that would be, that would probably be one of the areas, you know, Area 51 is where they test it, but you have to go back further and look at where they're developing it. And right. the thing is, is that there is a probably another, I think I read somewhere the other day, somebody asked, is there a new Manhattan Project? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, we're always trying to make better weapons to blow things up. But, Man, there's facilities so. underground laced all underneath this country. Yeah, Big. but you have to have the, yeah, I mean, we have a more modern uh, way of communicating, but it still can be mm. tapped. In other words, you can't, you can only keep communications so much secret. Where you do it is you do it in one place where you know who's working on it, how they're working on it, and everything else. Now, once it goes into the out to the operational yeah. R&D phase, then it has to be opened up more. But the initial work is just as important because once you know it works, you can then put counter stuff out to the other sides, sending them down a complete wild goose chase on right. what what's going on. And as soon as they see this technology, which by the way, let's just say they purposely did do that to, to you know get the Chinese and the Russians' attention, that you can't really get a good read on it anyway, just kind of like the Calvin picture, right, Professor? Well, and lessons from history that John was in the Air Force during stealth. 
I mean, stealth was leaked. We had the Have Blue program. That was secret. By the time uh, what looked like an early um, stealth fighter was coming out, it you know it put the willy up China and Russia. Good British phrase. And um, but the truth was, we had we'd had stealth for years. So it's a it it, it was a, cl a maybe that's what's happening today. We're saying, ooh, maybe. Maybe we do have this. China and Russia, go and research, spend lots of your money, come up with something. But actually, we've got a rather advanced system in the background anyway. You know, who knows? Well, you got to look at the pictures. Look at the technology Russia and China's developed. It looks just like ours. Think about right. this, guys. If we built it first, we understand the weaknesses of it, right? So eventually, right. if they steal it and they develop it, we're already going to know how to identify it and how to countermeasure it. It's kind of like, it, you know, I'm not trying to go anywhere, but otherwise, if you're going to create a biological weapon, you're going to create the uh, antidote to take care right. of it. So, so you create the <laughs> biological weapon. If you're going to use it, you're going to have your side have the antidote to not, you know, be affected by it. So. If the Chinese and Russians are trying to copy all our technology, and we're the ones that developed it first, we're already going to know how to counter it. And we're going to have the Go countermeasures. Ahead. Never mind, it's been out in government documents. They're looking to taking the pilot out of the aircraft as much as oh. they can, including right. the new bombers. So you would, you would start small to actually make it work and then figure out how to expand it into the bigger aircraft. And they've been talking about that for over 20, 30 years. But it still goes back to where did they get the technology, the materials, the plasmas? Well, how did they study it? And I don't know if I could ever get to Robert Bigelow, but I challenged George Knapp and others to have him come out and tell us what he meant on 60 Minutes when they're here among us. They've never given a clear explanation. Maybe they laid down Project it. Garnet up under his nose. No, but I mean, what does he know that they're here? What is here? Is it right. UAPs? Is well, when it... he got that government contract for those 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 pods, he gave up on his search for you know ways to get people to his hotels. I always thought that that he was really in a super quick search to get his hands on technology that could get his patrons to his hotels in space. He wanted to be the first hotel on entrepreneur in the orbit he wanted that position he wanted that title he wanted to be the first one to put people in a hotel in orbit around the earth because it's going to happen there's no question about it it's uh, going to happen and he'll be the pioneer that started that forever he will forever be you know genesis one and genesis two are still up there and they're still communicating back on earth but once uh, he got to that point it was just like you know to hell with aliens and ufos he was paying north of 15 million dollars a passenger just to get you know that's what it, the russians were going to charge him for a suicide you know it, it, that's crazy money there's nothing left for him you know yeah, but, but Rich, uh, those those were not hotels they were developed to put around the moon and mars to work on mining the the uh, materials that are up on these uh, two planets i mean i said as soon as i saw it he bought it from nasa but what have they done? They've outsourced. He bought all, what from NASA? The the actual the the hotels were actually a NASA project that he went in and purchased from them and took it over because they were having cost overruns. So he took and bought the project out from NASA and then started going further with the project. But he used it under the guise of hotels when in reality that's what they're going to use. They're on it's on the space station right now. Why would they have to hide right. that? What? Why would because, there be guys be, involved? Because Why would they hide that. Because the fact of the matter is, you're trying to get to Mars and and the Moon based off of minerals that we need to advance our space program. A lot of this has already been farmed out. Musk has taken over SpaceX. You know, uh, there's right, another right. space company. They're 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 splitting the costs from the government to private industry who does it better. Government projects suck, guys. I mean, it's not just the high technology, 
But when you put the government in charge of something, there's constant cost overruns. When it gets done and done quickly and done right and under cost is when there's a contractor with investors in it that has to get it done. They have to get it done in a timely manner because it's their dollars, not taxpayer dollars that they can constantly overrun with it. And the whole thing is the the hotel is connected to the space or the space station right now. They have one up there. They're going to use this to uh, probably work on the next future craft that are going to advance out into space and put them around mo the moon and Mars because that's where people are going to have to live to work on the technology because a lot of it's going to be AI to um, actually um, you know harvest these minerals that they've openly admitted there's stuff up there that they need to advance the new technology. So, one of the so, so one Don, of the is, 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 is Bigelow still on the NASA Mars moon mission with these pods or no? You'd have to ask him. But James, go ahead with what you were going to say because it was important. Sorry. Sorry. I apologize for uh, interjecting there. I'm new to this, obviously. Um, the, one of the papers um, that was in the 38 was just a small brief on the idea that you could extract negative energy or negative matter from the moon itself. And it was one of the ideas on what they could do to push forward their, their you know, their Alcubierre drive and, and all this, you know, this theory to help push through their theory. So that actually going to the moon and trying to extract things from the moon was within the 38 of the papers that were, that were uh, you know, right. were part of the of the link you know part of what was presented i should say sorry right i need to get the i need to get the paper but uh again it's just we're we're not suggesting that you know and they, what we're saying is that there's other people that have been looking at doing exactly what or similar to what john's john's saying actually using the moon as a source for whatever they need to be able to produce better technology uh, or you know uh cheaper ways of of doing things yeah, yeah and you know that you know they actually built a moon base this is <laughs> back in the 1960s um they proposed an exact copy on the moon and went and built it in the arctic the uh under under arctic nuclear powered tunnels that they built um was just a mock-up of what they thought you know if you can survive in the arctic Okay, you've got a bit more air, but it's damn cold. It was it was a it was a precursor of what they were actually planning <laughs> with a cut, cut and cover and a nuclear reactor um, on the moon. Yeah. What well, one of the things I think that delayed, you know, if, you know, there's arguments that we never went to the moon, but let's get past that. Let's say one of the things that delayed yeah. us going to the moon and to Mars was that the AI technology that they needed to, you know, go ahead and take advantage of whatever the moon and Mars and even these these um, asteroids or media asteroids, didn't we just land on an asteroid because one of the things was they are trying to figure out to alter the course. Well, right. supposedly these asteroids hold minerals on them from other places, yeah. right? So sure. if we're trying to advance technology, you're going to have to go up there where it's at. And and not only that, and I go, I know this is science fiction, but think about what Star Trek came out in the 60s, how much of the stuff they talked about in the 60s is now being utilized in today's world, okay? But to build a ship, like a starship, it has to be built in space. Right. It can't be built on the ground. So oh. if they're going to build this, it's actually what you're seeing in these Star Trek shows. They're going to have to put a complex above the Earth, or let's say a lot of the materials they need are in the Moon or Mars. They're going to have right. to build it there. Okay. Right. So yes, this is advanced stuff that's not necessarily UAP per se, but the materials needed are you know are coming from somewhere that they're working on, which involves lasers, UAPs, plasmas, and everything else, and this all right. ties together to the study of uaps which have been tried they've tried to separate from ufos so right. this is all the stuff that we're planning on covering going forward 
Excellent. Speaking of that, you know, the, you know, in the, in the NASA and everything, um, you know, we talked a little bit about that while we were in the program. What are your guys thoughts on NASA getting into the game? Like uh, officially announcing now that, you know, they have their own team that's looking into the UAP topic, the UAP subject. Well, no, I think, or, or, no, go ahead, Simon, go ahead. Yeah. I think I would actually like to make a slight correction. You remember that NASA is actually the, you know, National Aeronautic and Space Authority, whatever NASA stands for. But I mean, as a pilot, you actually consult and actually file stuff with NASA because they actually deal with stuff in our atmosphere as well as space. They're not just a space agency. So I could, I think I think it's quite valid that they that they are involved with UAP and and weird stuff in our atmosphere. Well, I, I think the notion that NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, I think that I guess I guess it's kind of in the back of my mind that, of course, NASA would be in right. the forefront of objects in our atmosphere and outside of our atmosphere would be of paramount concern to anything. Right and everything that they would do. So, right. you know, for them to come out and make an, uh, uh, an, an official announcement that they were going to be looking into the UAP subject on the record, uh, I just kind of wondered what your thoughts were on that. What do you think, John? I mean, okay, they just acknowledge what they've been doing for how long? I mean, if if they have to have access to this technology and what's going on because of the fact that they're sending stuff into space. Um, they farmed it out now to other companies, private industry companies, but ultimately they're going to have to, um, they're going to have to acknowledge they're looking at it just no different than Nora is looking at it now in space command and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're actually putting out a little bit more because as we go more and more into space, it's going to be harder and harder to hide this new technology. Right. What do you think, uh, James? Well, Not again, going back, to, well, going back to 1979, it was you know it was um they were they were we we know about it. it's it's well known the field resonance propulsion concept uh, written by uh, Alan Holt in '79. You know, it discusses in there um, using uh, studying unidentified flying objects uh, to find out um, how we could use it for our own technology to move forward. And it's, it's, it's such an interesting paper, you know, and it goes back to 79. And there's even discussions in there about the injuries that some of these UAP causes, you know, wow. and uh, maybe investigating those to find out what this technology is. So, I mean, we go back to 1979, so they was well yeah. aware back then, and uh, people like Alan Holt and that all move in the same circles. So all this that's there in 1979, you might may as well tattoo it on yourself for now and leave yeah. it there because it means everything for the future. It means everything for now, to, in, in, my, in my eyes, because of, you know, the, the idea that they're only seeing this as a new thing and, and they've never really studied it properly or they've never really, they've always poo-pooed it. I mean, this this kind of stuff here, it's 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 fantastic, you know, it, and it's NASA. It's uh, it's on the NASA paper. Right. right. Yeah. And NASA is the granddaddy, right? I mean, they, right. they have to know where every flock of bird is <laughs> within a launch site and which direction they're headed. You know, they have to know the weather. They have to know the wind. They have to know the humidity, the barometric pressure. They have to know everything. And so you can count them as experts in monitoring the atmosphere and the environment around us. Um, in this program, we covered a lot of stuff. Even the DOD and the CIA's secret project to bring the second coming of Jesus Christ over, you know, to overthrow Fidel Castro. There was a lot in this show, but it's all in the basis of UAP and government involvement and projects and, and work that, that those in and around the government have done. And it's all in the, in the race to weaponize this technology. And where did it come from? John keeps saying that he keeps pounding it into my head. 
where, 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 where did it come from? Where did, you know, human beings are quite intelligent and quite, uh, you know, the, the, the ingenuity is boundless. I mean, it the creativity and, and, and the ability to manifest things from our dreams are, it's absolutely something um, I think that the movie uh, Sphere sort of displayed about the, the human brain itself. Only their brain was a big gold ball in a, you know, in a spaceship on the bottom of the ocean. But it was a fantastic sort of analogy of how you gather enough human beings around the same idea and you give them all the support that they need to do what they, they can do best. And it gets done every time. And we were talking about, you know, these facilities that are working on these projects. I'm, I'm one of these ones that feel like facility A is over here, black budget, compartmentalized, fully financed. B is over here. C is down there. And D is up there. And maybe one or two of these know the others exist and the rest don't. I feel like there's a triangle mm -hmm. plane they're building over here and there's one they're trying to build over here and neither one knows the other one exists and neither one of them <laughs> get off the ground and both of them spent, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars and we'll never know anything about any of them. And I think that, that, that that's how I envision, you know, that's my, that's the way I think that it happens and eventually something is given birth to productivity and that line of thought, that line of projection is where they jump on and they run and they, they complete right. the project and they actually create something like a Tic Tac. Um, I remember seeing a video of a little pill shaped object that's probably about this big and it could hover and it shot psh, 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 and it could move around like, you know, in a grid even. Right. And then, and then eventually it would run out of whatever was holding it up or they shut it off and then it would just fall down into a net. And I wished I had saved that information, that video and that information on that. Because I saw this probably 12, 13 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. whenever this whole tack came, Tic Tac thing came out and Fravor was talking about, his description was like if you put a ping pong ball in a pickle jog and just started right. bouncing it around in there that's what this thing was moving like it was just right. bouncing around everywhere right. and right. that thing looked like that to a great degree um and i think there's another there's another point that if it is a visualization way back when the nimitz encounter occurred these were reasonably simple shapes you see the sphere the cube the Tic Tac, and I think things have moved on. And I think now you can actually go out and buy a countermeasures that will project uh, an F-22 replica, a loyal wingman that looks like a plane. So I think there's a clue in its shape. You know, it's like a eight bit countermeasure possibly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Dig Dug, <laughs> the Dig Dug countermeasure. Uh, right. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, right. the, 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 the rise in sightings of UAPs, the, the ability for Navy uh, personnel to be able to openly report uh, these sightings, pilots, a lot of, of commercial pilots even now are starting yeah. to come forward. Um, I think a lot of that was due to treatment from the pandemic as well. Uh, but with that said, the, you know, James so astutely brought up the fact that, you know, not only are they seeing where things are reported, but where they're not. And that James, you're, you're brilliant, dude. I love you, man. But like, you know, there's, there's a lot of information that can be derived from that. And that's a track that I've made note right. of when I was right. doing the read for this script, this, this show. I made notes there because that's a direction that I want to go in with my research. Um, the, you know, when these guys talk, there's a certain amount of stuff that we need to try to, to derive from it. And that is when we put our mind in theirs 
and try to figure out what what would what would inspire them or what would direct them i should say not inspire but direct them to say what they said and why they said it and right. so you know i think that there's a lot of work to be done there but mm-hmm. there was so much in this show um yeah. the uh the, you know the overall applications of technology beyond ours and how to derive ideas and inspirations and and real data from it is the mm-hmm. direction that i think we're going and and you know in your video about the calvine you had you you know you had put in things about 3d printing you know what i mean and I, that, you know this right. this this thatching uh, you know, and, and, and sort of all of this nano work that's going on and this 3d printing right. today that they're doing now is so it's almost, it's for someone like me, that is not an academic. It is bizarre right? to see right. how it's done, to see what they've done and how far they've gone. Just, I mean, I'm still giddy about ground penetrating radar. I'm still giddy about how they're right. doing they're right. penetrating with wave technology and sound right. deep down into the ground, way far down into the ground. Um, right. I'm still fascinated with just that. But when you take a look, even at a microscopic level of 3D printing and how it's working, it, it's just mind boggling. So the materials that they're starting to be able to create, John, James, you guys, we all have been talking about meta materials for a long, long time. Um, the, the, you know, long before Luis Elizondo and Mella never dove into the pool. And um, publicly, I should say. I think they were involved, okay. you know, back there, but not out in the wide open. But with that said, um, you know, our former colleague, Linda Moulton Howe, had some in her hands. Jacques Vallée went out and collected... Right. you know a, a dozen samples he did uh, yeah. yeah and he and 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 are working on having those analog analyzed i've got a guy right up here in missouri that's livid with luis Elizondo and all of them because he gave them a sample and hasn't heard anything oh. back from them right and you know how many people in the world today have have given photographs mm. six of them in, in scotland over there that have never right. been seen from again. Oh, we gave them back to the newspaper that gave them to us. Well, what was the name of the person you gave them to? I, I, you know, I really don't remember. Right. You go to the newspaper. Where are those six negatives of photographs? We never got them. Right. They just <laughs> vanish. And the same they way did. with samples, the same way with materials, the same way with Bigfoot DNA. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it just, all this stuff seems to go to a magic hole somewhere. I can't wait till I cross over to the other side. That's gonna be one of the first things that I I ask the creator <laughs> up there. Is where's that where's that trash bin at that's got all this stuff in it, right? Um, right? I'm gonna figure out a way to get it back to all of my people down there so they can get the answers they need. Good. Uh, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, this was a fantastic program. It really we really touched on a lot of points that make it important in the discussion of the UAP topic. Um, yeah. You know, these, these, these ultimate weapons that right. are, you know, are on the forefront. Right. I, uh, right. We're, uh, we're coming right up on the end of the program. So, and John, you've right. got things you've got to get to. And, and Can I close please? Yeah, absolutely. So in your chair, take off brother. I, will, I want to sum up a few things. Okay. Number one, folks, you want to see the future? Go to the papers that were declassified for uh, Senator McCain's committee to look at what they where we're going forward as far as um, technology goes and where we're going to be, let's say, in a couple decades or maybe even sooner. Because I believe some of it's probably at least on the drawing board, if not in R and D. So, and it's interesting about that was because even I didn't know when when they got involved with me to help get get my surgery and stuff and obviously they analyzed my um, DNA and actually got tissue they uh, immediately afterwards went to Senator McCain's committee to get funding for advanced technology the other interesting thing is is with these papers 
I believe, I guess they were declassified right after the FOIA went in and they admitted that he they were, he was approached and these papers declassified, which I find interesting. But ultimately, I want to sum it up as this, folks. We're moving forward faster than ever. Technology is right. taking leaps and bounds. And there's it's not just because, not that we don't have the best of the best working on it, but there's something else to this that we're trying to show. And just remember one thing as we close in our show, what the words of Von, Von Braun said about where this would all end up. And he actually was pretty much right where we're heading right now. Yeah. James, you're up next. Mm. Oh, right. well, your, th headed... your thoughts on this episode of the program, brother, or anything else? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, this episode literally is we are we are just trying to um, uh, put forward um, some research that, that 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 is relevant to us and obviously relevant to the entire you know um, subject. Uh, we we want other people to look at it and to do their own research and to draw their own conclusions um about Very about good. actually what's going on um i mean there's i'm in the pipeline at the moment i'm still looking at um uh, stuff a lot more ahead of what we're what we're putting on the show at the moment um but what what i do advise is please watch please uh, listen to what we're saying do your own research chase up what we're 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 putting forward and come to your own conclusions um and uh, enjoy the ride well, well. <laughs> very yeah. well said james i mean that's something that i should be reminding everybody and, yeah. and thank you for bringing that up professor simon you have the floor my good man well my point is i'm actually new to this team and i'm super impressed by all of your work and um it parallels things that i've been interested in um for many years and i think together we can actually move forward and actually answer some of those big questions. We're going after the Rendlesham <laughs> truth. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. going after the truth. And from your beautiful abode, your farm in France, and, and <laughs> from, from the wonderful locations that we come from all four corners of this world to all of you, I want to thank every last one of you for watching the program. We're in our second live show here on the network of uh of unxnetwork.com and all of our audio versions are all over there on spreaker spotify iheart apple google podcasts and all kinds of podcast pockets all over the world wide web everybody there's links and descriptions on most of everything we talked about tonight provided by our fantastic uh researchers and 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 sleuths uh for this uh script on this program so it's all down there for you because we want to engage critical thinkers bright minds right. and those of you out there who come across this video today tomorrow next week a year from now and say i have some first-hand information or second-hand information right that might be very pertinent to what you guys are doing and uh and you reach out to us that way that would that's that's that right there is what keeps the engine burning that's what keeps right. the motor running so follow us if you like what we're doing and if you like like uh the you know the work we're doing on uaps follow us on uh, our youtube channel at right. youtube.com at phenomenon radio show professor simon's link down below professor thank you so much for all that you've done for us and helping promote us and get us off the ground I appreciate Good. it. All right, gentlemen, Good. for that, we are at a wrap for this edition for the show. Didn't mean to cut you off there, Professor. But no. we'll be back in two weeks with another live episode of Phenomenon Radio. And until then, enjoy the Phenomenon Radio remastered classics that we'll be uploading on our YouTube channel throughout uh, the, each and every week. We've got four seasons that we've got to put to video and uh and the audio to those videos and get those up for you so we'll be doing that all along the way for you and you can get those audios uh over on spreaker spotify iheart and, and google Podcasts, and all your favorite podcast platforms all over we'll see you in two weeks for another live edition and thank you all for watching have a great night and a great weekend everybody 